Yeah, so so good afternoon again, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Reed. I, I know many of you. Um, I'm an infectious disease doc um, based at the Institute for Global Health Sciences. And on behalf of my colleagues, Naomi Baylor and Eliza Love from the Decolonizing Global Health Working Group, we are really excited for you to join us today. I think you're all aware of growing calls to decolonize global health from global health scholars and practitioners, um, especially if, if, if any of you attended Madhu Pai's Grand Rounds here at the Institute for Global Health Sciences um, last year in February of, of 2020, where he exhorted us to, to, uh, to uh, a, a global health makeover. Well, it's in this context that UCSF Decolonizing Global Health Working Group was established, and we, we seek to serve a few functions. We, we, we hope in large part to elevate diverse and multidisciplinary voices with experience in this area, but also to inform and, and change uh, UCSF policies um, for, for, for around global health in, insofar as we, we are able to and, and can motivate for a decolonizing agenda as it relates to policy, uh, education um, and program implementation. And so it's, it's in this context that we're especially excited to launch a series of, of, of relatively informal discussions on the topic reimagining global health. Um, it's our hope that this series can be a catalyst for the urgent change that's necessary to ensure that the praxis of global health is, is culturally sensitive, anti-racist and, and anti-colonial. Um, and so in that context, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Naomi Baylor, who's going to introduce our first guest in this series. Over to you, Naomi. Great. Thanks, Mike. So I am very excited to speak with Dr. Renzo Guinto, who is one of the really leading voices in two exciting new, new movements. One, the decolonizing global health, and the other is planetary health. Um, so Dr. Guinto is the chief planetary doctor of PH Lab, a uh, call think and do tank for advancing the health of people and the planet. He is an associate professor of practice of global public health and the inaugural director of the global health program at St. Luke's Medical College in the Philippines. Um, Renzo is also an Obama Foundation Asia Pacific leader, Aspen Institute New Voices Fellow and climate reality leader from the initiative of the former US Vice President Al Gore. And he is very active in the global health community, sitting on the editorial advisory board of the Lancet Planetary Health, um, participating in the forum on climate change and health for the World Innovation Summit for Health as a next generation One Health advisor on the Lancet One Health Commission. And he received his doctor of public health from Harvard University and doctor of medicine from the University of the Philippines and has traveled extensively lecturing and presenting around the world and is widely published. So we are super excited to have Renzo join us today. Um, he's going to kick off with a brief presentation, um, sharing some slides with us on his work and thinking on decolonization in global health. Then we will um, ask a few questions to him to get the conversation started and then open it up to Q&A from all of you. So feel free to drop some questions in the chat and Eliza will help moderating that. And also, you know, we're a pretty small group. So um, chime in. Oh, all right, Renzo, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hello everybody. Uh, good morning from Manila, uh, Philippines. It's already, uh, uh, April 23 here. I believe it's still April 22 there. So happy Earth Day. Um, and, and thanks, Naomi, for that very generous introduction and for acknowledging uh, my uh, involvement in both uh, decolonizing global health and also in planetary health, which later on I will actually be touching on. And uh, I would like to thank UCSF, the Global Health Group, for, again, this opportunity. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous pressure, especially hearing that I am the opening salvo of this new Reimagining Global Health series, and I hope that I'll be able to meaningfully contribute to this uh, emerging discourse uh, within your uh, institute. So 
you know, for the next couple of minutes, because I really want us to have a conversation. I know we have an hour, and so I'll try to finish this on the 30th uh, minute, and so we can have uh, a discussion. And these slides will really just provide the raw material for what I would love to, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, later, uh, again, as uh, in a conversation. And first, I want to thank Mike. Uh, for this uh, really exciting opportunity that I had the privilege of, of being part of. And, you know, I woke up today uh, or 30 minutes ago and then I saw my Twitter exploding because Madhu Karpai tweeted the uncorrected proof of this article uh, that is part of a series that Mike, uh, you know, uh, edited and, and led. And so, you know, this is a very, very fresh article, uh, hot of the press. And, uh, you know, I think some of the ideas that I'll be actually touching upon are, are in this article, but I think this also will, uh, this article has uh, a lot of uh, recommendations and, and uh, you know, strong uh, messages about, again, how do we address power asymmetries how do we decolonize global health? And it's written uh, mainly and co-written mainly by emerging decolonizers from the global south, uh, of course, with the shepherding of Madhukar Pai from McGill and Shea Bimbola from uh, Sydney. So I would encourage you, and I believe uh, Mike already shared uh, the link with you. So uh, hopefully you will uh, find this very insightful and inspiring. To, uh, and informative uh, to your emerging work. I want to start also by acknowledging my privilege. And, you know, a few days ago, I was in Karolinska Institute, and I noticed that, you know, the speakers, especially the student speakers, began their remarks by acknowledging their privileges, their positionality. And so I, you know, commented that maybe this is the new norm. This is the new normal for global health in the decolonized global health in the decolonized global health era you know the physicians in the room would know would know that uh, before we present uh, our you know our, or give our lectures we always have this slide where we present our conflicts of interest right our potential conflicts of interest i get money from pharma i am sitting the boards of this and that we also do that when we uh, submit our papers to the lancet or the new england journal and maybe the future of global health will also begin with acknowledging explicitly these kinds of, you know, privileges and positionalities, but also, uh, you know, how may, we may be inadvertently uh, be contributing to the exacerbation of, you know, existing power asymmetries uh, and also the uh, different disadvantages that we've, uh, you know, faced, uh, you know, over the course of our life. And so I want to acknowledge, you know, I'm a Filipino young uh, you know, male uh, scholar, practitioner, emerging early career or, you know, approaching mid-career, physician by training, uh, who had the privilege to study uh, a doctorate uh, in one of the most uh, prestigious, if not colonial, schools of public health in the world. You know, I'm from Harvard, but, you know, many friends of my, mine in Harvard know that I'm kind of anti-Harvard uh, at times, you know, criticizing its role in, again, the reproduction of the inequalities and the asymmetries. Uh, so, you know, this is really part of my journey and decolonizing is both political but also personal. And I myself am, con uh, uh, con do con uh, uh, am continuing, you know, to, to grapple with all these, uh, you know, tensions uh, in, in my, even within myself. So as you can see there, that's my doctoral committee, all white, all male. Uh, and that was when I was still, a, you know, a student and, you know, perhaps, you know, still learning how to decolonize myself. If I will have to, to create my committee now, probably that will not, surely, not probably, surely that will not be, you know, the composition. Having said that, they're all amazing uh, mentors to me. Uh, so, and, you know, I guess part of my, you know, the compromise, you know, when I was doing my doctoral dissertation is... I decided not to write a paper about another country or not to work on a data set coming from the World Bank. Instead, I spent my last year of doctoral studies at home here in the Philippines, and I decided to really work with 
the most uh, you know, marginalized of communities, coastal communities already affected by climate change. Naomi said, I'm in the field of planetary health. And one of my main research interests is um, you know, climate change and how it's affecting uh, the people's health, especially people in the Philippines and in the developing countries. And I guess part also of the decolonizing uh, of my own research is that you know, my doctoral dissertation is part 200 uh, page, uh, you know, work, but also it's part film. And I'm really proud, if not prouder of the film part, because one, that is uh, perhaps a, a, a way to challenge, you know, uh, academic tradition, you know, like, like, you know, my professors were both astounded, but also really thrilled that when I presented my doctoral dissertation, it actually is, you know, in the form of a film, again, which is not a conventional uh, uh, in the uh, scientific community, but also the films or in the films, um, you will never hear me speak. You will never hear, you know, Dorenzo who did a thematic analysis of what he heard from his respondents. It's the people themselves speaking in the film. And I think that is also important in the decolonizing journey are we listening meaningfully and with sincerity to the voices and, you know, not, uh, you know, again, from a scholarly standpoint, you know, trying to summarize what they said and then speaking on their behalf in these important platforms. And so how can we bring these voices, you know, to the room or to the Zoom rather uh, in this day and age of COVID? And then part of my decolonizing journey after my doctoral studies, instead of doing a postdoc in a uh, university, either in Europe or in North America, I decided to return immediately to the Philippines. And I said, you know what? I can build my own UCSF Global Health Institute. And so I joined one of the most, uh, uh, one of the top medical schools in the Philippines and an academic medical center to build the first center for planetary and global health. And I would love to forge col collaborations uh, with UCSF and the other institutes around the world, again, in the spirit of true collaboration and decolonization. And then finally, I also am building my own lab. It's called PH Lab. And PH stands for three things at least. PH is the Philippines. That's the nickname of my country. PH is also public health, people's health but also planetary health, which I will be uh, talking about in my conclusion. And yeah, I will, you know, again, California is known to be, you know, it's known for its Silicon Valley, the epicenter of technological innovation. And I always say that the Philippines and many countries in the world, developing countries, could be the Silicon, not Valley, but islands of planetary health innovation. Uh, focusing and emphasizing on bottom-up approaches, mobilizing communities to protect their own health while they also protect our common home, planet Earth. Okay, so where do I come from? You know, you know that I'm already from the Philippines, but the Philippines is a country that has experienced not just one, not just two, but, you know, at least three, you know, at least three uh, uh, periods of colonization. So, it's very interesting, it's 2021, and right now the country, the government of the Philippines is commemorating, good thing it's commemorating, not celebrating, the 500th year of the arrival, not the discovery, the arrival of Spain in the Philippines as our first Western colonizer. You know, the way the government framed it is, it's 500 years of Christianity. The Philippines is the only Christian Catholic country in Asia surrounded by a sea of Muslims and Buddhists and other religions. And then, you know, so, so that's the, the uh, you know, the, the, the first uh, wave of colonization, 333 years under Spain. And then next, Spain sold the Philippines to the United States, your country, uh, for $20 million uh, when Spain lost the war. Uh, you know, the Spanish-American War of 1890, you know, 6 to 1898, I believe. And the U.S. came, uh, President McKinley called it benevolent assimilation. You know, let's uh, assimilate the Philippines, uh, and uh, which, which they called 
our little brown Americans. As you can see, you know, that picture of, uh, you know, uh, a white American colonizer and some of the indigenous uh, Filipinos uh, during that time. Uh, and, and we know that, you know, the U.S. spent around 50 years in the Philippines um, overlapping with World War II. And when World War II ended, the Philippines got quote unquote liberated. And then the Philippines is now on its own, you know, to govern themselves. 2021, you know, we are still very much beholden uh, to the United States, very strong relationships, uh, relationship with the country, but also on the other side of the country, we are now seeing the emergence of a new colonizer, a neo-colonizer in the name of China, which is beginning to occupy some of our islands in the West Philippine Sea. So that is why, you know, as, as a Filipino, I feel strongly about, you know, colonization and colonialism. But also, you know, colonialism um, has been uh, an agent of, of medicine, of, of the spread of medicine. Um, and, and this is one of the uh, connections also with the Philippines. In the 1800s, you know, uh, the king of Spain during that time, um, you know, when he got introduced to the discovery of the smallpox vaccine by Edward Jenner, he decided to send around, I think it's, it's around 30, you know, Spanish boys first to Latin America and then eventually to the Philippines. Spanish vo boys inoculated, you know, with the smallpox vaccine. So before, remember, uh, you know, there, there's no transport technology, you know, the vaccine is stored in human subjects, you know, children. And eventually they were sent, uh, you know, to the Philippines. And what's interesting here is I would always say that, you know, perhaps the king of Spain during that time is the first Bill Gates, you know, thinking about, you know, uh, you know, his, um, you know, territories, his, um, you know, uh, subjects in the other side of the world. And let me send these vaccines that my children, because during that time, the, I think the first, uh, beneficiaries of that vaccine were the children of, of the king of Spain. Uh, and so he sent the vaccines to, you know, Latin America, the Philippines. But the sad story here is that, you know, one, uh, the names of the Spanish boys have been recorded, but the names of the Filipino boys that were sent to China to continue these uh, vaccine expedition were not recorded. And so, you know, it, it just, you know, um, you know, reminds me of the Ebola story. You know, we, rem we always say, oh, Peter Piot, you know, the, the, the director of the London School of Hygiene, he discovered the Ebola vaccine or the Ebola virus rather. But the, you know, the people in, um, um, you know, in, in, in Africa, um, you know, in, 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 you know, in who actually, um, you know, work on the uh, app, you know actual collecting, for instance, of the specimens, uh, and and working with the communities. They are not uh, recorded or they are forgotten in the history and in the story of global health. And then, you know, I also I also am thinking of of the other way around. You know, a while ago, it's colonialism as medicine. How colonialism has actually help spread this, you know, help the spread of, of Western medicine in particular. But also medicine is in itself a form of colonialism, right? Or medicine has very colonial, you know, features. And I would invite you to uh, take a look into these two uh, scholarly work, you know, uh, amazing scholarly work, first by Warwick Anderson, one of the preeminent historians of medicine. His doctoral dissertation is about American colonial medicine in the Philippines. Uh, he described, you know, the activities of the United States during that time in the early 1900s as part of its civil civilizing project, you know. You know, they, they, in, they established the Philippine General Hospital, the first, uh, and, and the, you know, the public health system of the country. You know, I remember when I was a kid, we were always taught, you know, Spain brought us Christianity, America brought us you know, public health and public education. And then now when I read this book uh, 20 years later, I discovered, oh, you know, the, the secrets behind that, uh, you know, project. And then of course, you know that uh, Filipinos, uh, Americans, you know, nurses uh, constitute uh, a huge part of, of your workforce, you know, and, and we've seen how disproportionately they were affected by COVID-19. 
Uh, and, you know, the wave of uh, health and workforce migration to the United States, uh, we know it's not a modern day phenomenon or it's not a, a recent phenomenon. And Catherine Sinisa Choi from, uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, the Department of uh, Asian American Studies, uh, wrote her dissertation about what she calls the empire of care and the colonial roots of the workforce migration, the United States teaching Filipinos nurses uh, in the Philippines in preparation for later work, you know, in the United States, work abroad. So, you know, how colonialism, how medicine, you know, and, and public health practices uh, were used as, as agents of, of colonialism. And this is also the interesting thing about the Philippines. So medicine was not only used to colonize us. Colonialism was not only used to introduce medicine to us. The, the colonizer of the country, the liberator of the country is actually a physician. And, you know, Dr. Jose Rizal uh, was born also in my hometown. Uh, I grew up an, a block away from his house. Um, you know, like me, and, and you know, I'm not saying I'm, you know, I, I think everyone is still aspiring to become Dr. Jose Rizal. At a young age, he went to Spain to study medicine, but it was in Spain when he had the, his eureka moment, you know, that he realized that, you know, if these democracies in Europe can become free countries, why can't the Philippines as well? And so he wrote two novels that sparked the Philippine Revolution and went back to the Philippines to be executed by Spanish authorities. Uh, but then that sparked the, you know, the wave of you know, revolutions that led to uh, the liberation of the Philippines. Unfortunately, what the Filipinos didn't know was that they were deceived by Spain because behind the scenes, Spain, as I've mentioned, was already selling the Philippines to the United States. And so when you know, the US uh, arrived in the Philippines, the Filipinos were, uh, quite surprised. They thought that they were already a free nation only to realize there's a new colonizer arriving, uh, a new colonizer with stronger, uh, you know, uh, armaments, uh, you know, bigger guns and, and ships than, than Spain. But also Rizal is a very good friend of another, you know, I would say uh, the colonizer and, and that is Rudolf Virchow, you know, and of course we in global health, public health medicine, we know Rudolf Virchow is the father of social medicine. He once said, aren't the diseases of the populace traceable to defects in society? Uh, and he also said that, you know, ultimately the solutions to epidemics and inter it's interesting, right? Because we now are living in the time of perhaps the biggest epidemic that the world has ever seen. He once said that the real solution to epidemics are not vaccines, are not medicines, but education, prosperity, and liberty. So, you know, Rizal and Virchow were very good friends when Rizal was, was in Germany. And, uh, you know, Virchow uh, was very supportive of the liberation movement uh, here in the Philippines. So, you know, that is the, the impetus of my, um, you know, uh, interest in this nexus of colonialism, decolonization, decoloniality, uh, and medicine and public health, and of course, in this day and age, global health. And it started with this hashtag that I, you know, I didn't really start the decolonizing global health conversation. I think it's, an emer it's been an emerging conversation for many, many, many years. But this is the first ever tweet that used the hashtag decolonize global health. And you know, I, I wrote this in 28, late 2018 as a reaction to a friend's uh, tweet. And, and it's talking about why, uh, you know, colonialism and, and patriarchy uh, and male supremacy are siblings. Um, and this is the start of my engagement uh, in this conversation. And since then, there have been a lot of articles that have been written about decolonizing global health, about whether global health is it inherently, you know, a colonial, you know, sector, a colonial field, etc. And we've seen this wave of student uh, activism and, and uh, conferences around this subject. I'm glad that UCSF has now started a, a series, but it's actually the students that brought the conversations to Harvard, to Karolinska, to Edinburgh, to Duke. Uh, and my main challenge is that how can we bring these similar conversations 
to the global south, to the colonized uh, countries or to the countries who really experience the, the, the uh, colonialism, you know, firsthand. And, you know, of course, I'm sure you've seen uh, over the course of the pandemic, a lot of the discussions about the colonial manifestations of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 response, you know, uh, uh, national task forces still very much male dominated, uh, the top down imposition of uh, policies and, you know, uh, the disregard of the power of community action, for instance, in preventing uh, or, or mitigating and containing uh, the pandemic. And so, I think COVID-19 is, is really just a mirror and a magnifying glass, you know, of, of the things that we've already known in global health for some time, you know, global health security indices that have been developed from the perspective of the global north. And then now the very countries that, you know, top the index are also unfortunately the very countries that are experiencing uh, the suffering uh, and, and the challenges of COVID-19. Um, you know, and you, you hear scientists saying, let's, you, you know, use the global south as guinea pigs for the vaccine for, you know, the new therapies. And so all of these, you know, you might say are not new. They were already existing before and COVID-19 just, um, you know, uh, made them more uh, pronounced uh, and, and uh, just exposed these, um, you, know, um, you know, defects of global health. But also, I think COVID-19 is a gateway to the next. You know, it's opening a new window again with all these uh, conversations happening both on Twitter and uh, you know uh, in the in the written form. Uh, but also now we're seeing, for instance, Asian countries showing the world how to contain a pandemic. Countries that we've underestimated in global health for the longest time. And of course, some really strong proposals, even you know, to move the WHO to Africa, because if WHO really wants to be of service to global health, they should not be sitting in comfortable Geneva. They should be close to where the global health challenges are. And so what does decolonizing global health mean to me? And for me, it's really about, you know, in global health, we talk a lot about equity, and we talk about equity in the realm of outcomes, right? Global health outcomes, equity in maternal health, equity in, you know, access to healthcare, universal health coverage. I think we should also be talking about equity in the operations of global health, how we are, you know, um, managing our affairs, how we recruit, how we hire, how we uh, conduct our research, how we fund, how we make decisions. I've also already said that decolonizing is both, you know, a personal and even a psychological process. And uh, again, as, as I admitted, I myself am still trying to dismantle all these uh, mental models that have been um, embedded on me through my education, through my experiences. But also, I think it's a societal and a structural process. You know, we cannot just keep on talking about individual decolonizing. We need to challenge, you know, the structures that perpetuate the colonial behaviors that we all, uh, you know, possess and manifest. And ultimately, I think it's about tackling the unequal distribution of power. How do we change? How do we transform the old white senior boys club of global health deciding for the rest? And I think, you know, the line, uh, nothing about us without us uh, should be, uh, should resonate now more than ever before. And so, Right now, and I know, you know, I promise that we should have some discussion today. Uh, I'll just, you know, do a quick rundown of all these issues or themes in the decolonizing global health space. And you might know uh, some other themes that are, that should be part of this conversation. One is racial inclusion and diversity, whether in, you know, in the faculty of UCSF, right? How many faculty from the global south uh, do you have in your global health department or is it a pseudo global health department? Sorry if I'm being very, you know, provocative and straightforward here, but also uh, representation in committees, in advisory boards, in, you know, journals, uh, you know, there's an article here stuck in the middle, you know, now we're seeing a lot of African uh, sounding names in the byline, but they're neither the first or the last author. So we, we know that they are not, 
you know, the lead authors or not the supervisors, for instance, the senior authors of these uh, research projects. Uh, I've seen a, uh, an editorial board of a re relatively new global health journal with med members all from the global north, right? And so how can it be a global health journal? There's this interesting article, which is more of a satire, how not to write about global health. The, and I invite you to, to read this. And, and you know, I'll, I, this is a recorded session. So, you know, you have the slides and you can all Google these articles and, and really um, have the time to digest. You know, decolonizing is, is the decolonizing global health conversation is very much intertwined with discussions around intersectionality. And this kind of panel, which we call a manel, an all-male panel, should be made obsolete in the era of, you know, in the era of, in the post-COVID uh, global health era, okay? And of course, you know, we know global health leadership is still very much skewed. Global health organizations trying to address uh, issues in LMICs, low middle income countries, but all of them, again, sitting in their comfortable seats in North America and Europe, okay? And so is global health leadership truly global? These numbers from Global Health 5050, which is a global initiative based in the University College London, um, you know, shows to you that, that it's not, you know. And as you can see there, uh, uh, a huge uh, proportion of global health leaders have degrees from Harvard and UCS, the UC system and the Stanford's and the London schools of the world. And so we really need to uh, address these power asymmetries. And then it's also about reciprocity in global health. And this is an area where UCF, UCSF as an academic institution might actually play a critical role in, you know, how do we increase bi-directional exchanges of knowledge, you know? And so, you know, I'm glad that, uh, for instance, you are inviting someone from the other side of the world to, you know, give a talk. And so how can we uh, do these uh, activities in a reciprocal and bi-directional manner, you know, exchanges of faculty, uh, exchanges of students, uh, really deep and, and meaningful collaboration. You know, we know that some passports are more privileged than the others. Uh, and now there's a new kind of passport that is emerging, the vaccine passport, the immunity passport. So if we do not tackle this, we might be seeing future global health conferences you know, that are hybrid, attended in person by those with immunity passports from the global north and, in, and attended, uh, you know, virtually by the rest of us who are not yet vaccinated. And then global health degrees, you know, uh, this is another study by Madhu Karpai at what cost, no? And it just shows to you how expensive uh, global health degrees are and how um, unevenly distributed global health degrees as well. And so, Right now, here in our new global health program in the Philippines, we're eyeing at, um, you know, potentially designing a Global South-led Master, Master of Global Health program. And we're also beginning to talk to our peers uh, in Latin America and Asia and in Africa so that, you know, we might be able to, dis to design a uh, co-delivered Master of Global Health program led by the Global South. So that will be an interesting model. In decolonizing global health, we also need to start interrogating our values, the frameworks that we use. A lot of them develop, or maybe all of them are developed by scholars from the global north. You know, the health systems frameworks, for instance, that we use, but also the language, right? And, you know, we've been using the words global north, global south. That's actually a remnant of, you know, colonial days. Um, and, and, you know, I'm actually quite torn, you know, between having to keep on using them because really there is still a global north and a global south and we need to keep on repeating and reiterating that these inequalities, these divides, these uh, still do exist. But also, again, you know, is, should these terms be made obsolete and instead we should come up with our new uh, typology, our new way of classifying um, for instance, uh, a friend of mine, uh, and this is in connection to planetary health, maybe we should start categorizing countries based on whether they are high polluting and low polluting, right? And, you know, low polluting countries will be definitely much more uh, emulated uh, than the high, high polluting ones or high carbon 
uh, intensive ones. And of course, when we talk with, when we talk about decolonizing global health, it's not just about the global health architecture, the global fund, the role of Bill Gates, the WHO. We also have to look at national health systems, which are you know one you know uh, uh, col colonial legacies you know, of their old colonizers, right? And and you know I always say maybe the reason why universal health coverage is still not happening is because. Our health systems are really, really designed, uh, you know, by the colonizers, left to us by the colonizers, and perpetuated by the neo-colonizers. So again, we need to look at national health systems, not just the global health system. And I already implied on this a while ago. How about the neo-colonizers in global health? So the neo-colonizers are not anymore just uh, countries, but also, you know non-state actors, corporations, for instance, uh, as you may be aware, there's a growing interest in the commercial determinants of health uh, and, and also the bilaterals and the multilaterals, you know, USAID, uh, which uh, will contract or will commission or contract out or give the, the funds to US-based uh, consulting firms uh, in the guise of helping the developing world. And so the money really uh, goes back to the pockets of, of the United States and its firms and its consultants rather than being truly invested in capacity development uh, in the global south. So again, what are these new forms of colonialism that we are seeing? This is part of the decolonizing global health conversation as well. And so we need to amplify voice. We need to claim space. There are new programs that are emerging uh, that are, uh, again, providing spaces for people like me who are you know, stepping up, who have seen uh, firsthand global health's coloniality and are, uh, you know, attempting to speak truth to power. And so we need to build these coalitions. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, again, create these spaces for people to be able to speak up. Okay. And I think it's also about humility and respect. And, you know, you've heard these terms, volunteerism, parachute research, uh, you know, Madhukar Pai listed uh, 10, uh, you know, fixes to global health malpractice. So, you know, we need to approach this with deep humility and respect, uh, you know, as, as we uh, try to uh, decolonize global health and decolonize ourselves. So, you know what, I have several other slides, but I know I re we really want to have a conversation. And so I'll just show this to you. And this is from Rupa Maria, which uh, who I believe is also from your part of the of, of your, your side of the states, she is saying that colonization is, is really multifaceted. It's about white supremacy, you know, um, and, and that's related to structural racism, uh, but also male supremacy. And that speaks to, you know, uh, the patriarchy, the sexism that we are still facing today, and also human supremacy. And this is the link to planetary health, right? That we humans are colonizing nature and colonizing the future as well. So these are all siblings. And if we really want to decolonize global health, we need to dismantle, again, structures of white supremacy, structures of, you know, gender inequality, and also structures that perpetuate, uh, you know, ecological uh, destruction. All of them are interrelated. And this is a diagram that is from the paper that we just published, uh, again, thanks to, to Mike's uh, shepherding. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, this is showing to you the connections you know, between all these different issues that I touch upon. Uh, and again, I invite you to read this, uh, this paper. So I will just jump to my final slide. And because I said, I want to give some final remarks about planetary health, you know, and there's already a discussion right now, you know, is it time to shift from global health to planetary health? Because global health is really about public health and it's about the health of people. And planetary health is about the health of people and planet. So we're now adding planet to the equation. And I think planetary health has an innate decolonizing power because one, in planetary health, we always acknowledge the importance of indigenous knowledge systems, which for millennia have already recognized the inextricable link between the health of the planet and the health of people. Unfortunately, Western science uh, created that the huge disconnect between the two. And then second, the colonizing, the decolonizing power of planetary health 
um, you know, uh, uh, is, is rooted in, in its very ethos, you know, that it's time to really shift from an ecological perspective, you know, where we are seeing ourselves as at the, being at the top of the pyramid of nature, of the hierarchy of nature, and instead shifting to a more ecological perspective, you know, that we are just part of these, uh, you know, fabric of nature. Chief Seattle once said that we are merely a strand in this fabric of nature. And what happens to, you know, the, the web, you know, we do it to ourselves as well. So, you know, we have so much to do. And these are just some of the ideas. I know that, you know, UCSF, the community might have uh, so much more. We need to continue being self-reflexive. We need to claim our space. We need to have critical global health education that is not apolitical and not a historical. We need to tackle the systematic roots, build global alliances uh, across borders, uh, beyond our shores. Culture of mentorship is key. And again, listen to new alternative voices. You know, we, we have the tendency to read only the people that we know. We have the tendency to read only the editorials and the papers of quote unquote global health rock stars that we that we know, the ones sitting in again the um, the, the usual uh, global health uh, you know empires, you know, structures. We need to start reading people from uh, you know other parts of the world, especially emerging scholars from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So together, let's decolonize global health and advance the health of people and planet. Thank you very much. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Renzo. That was fantastic. And uh, many, many different strands of thought for us to really start wrapping our heads around as we get deeper into this um, journey that we are, we're, we're kicking off. Um, I have... I have so many questions for you and I'm sure everyone else on the line does too, but I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, start with one, which is, so you, you went to Harvard, you, you talked about that and like our university here is another US university that generates huge amounts of funding and research and um, you know, funding from programs that are in global health. Um, so how do you go about um, persuading institutions like Harvard and like our own that decolonizing is a good business model um, and is, is the right next step for, for the institutions? And you know, if you can talk at all about the work that you've been doing and what some of the challenges are that you've faced and how you approach that. Right. That, that's a very, very good question. Uh, I think that's a paper that needs to be written, right? And, 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 and you know, you use the term business model because that's how uh, American academia is uh, looks at education and research, uh, unfortunately, right? That, that it's a business, and uh, and that's why um, you know we need more you know kids, uh, you know students, enrollees. We need more research money, uh, and then um, in in the pursuit of, of um, you know accomplishing that, you know. We, then we perpetuate these these colonial uh, behaviors. Uh, a lot of them I already mentioned. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, one, we need to be reminded about uh, what what really is the core of our enterprise. And that is, you know, and if global health is really about equity and justice, then we need to walk the talk, right? Um, I think now we're also realizing, as I've said, because of COVID that, you know, we, we really need, um, you know, greater and meaningful collaboration and respectful collaboration. Uh, this should also be a humbling experience, for instance, for the U.S. in particular, you know, that, that you know, and, and of course, I, I empathize with the situation in your country when it comes to COVID, but now you're seeing that, uh, you know, uh, you've been teaching the world global health, right? You've been teaching a lot of us global health, and, and then now um, it's, it's disappointing that we are seeing our teacher of global health to be not practicing what they preach to us. So that should be a humbling experience, actually, for ac American um, academic institutions, schools of public health in particular. Um, you know, there's a recent, um, you know, in, in, on Twitter, there was a, an explosion a few days ago. Uh, I think it was, I think USAID that, again, gave money to several U.S. institutions. Uh, they formed a coalition and uh, 
that, does that include UCSF or uh, a UC uh, campus? And and all of them were all from US and Global North. And the focus of the project is strengthening One Health, you know, capacity uh, or or, uh, or or pandemic preparedness capacity in Africa. And uh, and and the African institutions came up with a very uh, powerful commentary, I think, in in the BMJ criticizing that, you know. And so um, it, we're. we're we're far from, um, you know, uh, really achieving our goals in decolonizing and, and funding is one. Um, there are many ways also academic institutions can, can really do this. And for example, you know, what we're doing now, you know, Zoom is actually in a way democratizing global health education. And you must start thinking about, you know, en en enhancing access to global health education uh, that is cheaper, but still very meaningful. And maybe technology is going to help us do that. Uh, um, you know, these are just some ideas, and and I know that is a very challenging question, as I've said. You know, that's uh, uh, worth an, another commentary to write about. Uh, but you know, I would love UC SF in particular, but also the UC system in general to come up with um, you know a decolonizing plan. <laughs> uh, and and you know, just to share with you, as I've said uh, earlier in my talk uh, a week ago, I spoke in Karolinska. <laughs> And they already wrote their decolonizing plan with, with uh, a strong social movement. You know, I always say it takes two to tango. And the, the students in particular were the ones driving it at the bottom. But there is now leadership from the top. You know, the rector of Karolinska um, is, is, is very much involved. And, and you know, I, I told them that, you know, you're not just a, a public health institution. You're one of the most prestigious public health institutions in the world. So you really have a responsibility to take the lead. And I think UC is also in that league. <clears throat> Great. Um, for all of the folks listening in, please feel free to drop any um, questions that you have in the chat. And Eliza and I will make sure those get elevated. Um, I, I guess I have another question, which is, so you talked a lot about kind of the, this decolonization conversation that's really start, started in a lot of the um, Western U, um, academic institutions and how sort of the, the next place or the next arena for decolonization is really in the global South. So I'd be curious to hear more about your work in the Philippines, how you're kind of pursuing decoloniality and you know what your approach is and, and what you've been learning or reflecting on in that. Thanks for that question. And, and um, you know, not just in the Philippines, but in many developing countries, uh, yeah, yes, you know, they're, they're, they're the next arena, right? But it's a much more difficult arena because one, um, these are places where, you know, the, the manacles of, of colonialism are still very much, you know, embedded. Uh, and, and so um, um, there are a lot of barriers, uh, even, you know, in terms of, you know, speaking up, you know, you might get thrown to jail, you know, if you uh, speak all these um, kind of uh, progressive uh, ideas. Um, and also, you know, uh, when the colonizers left these old colonies, they were replaced by neo-colonizers. And these are, you know, the, the new elite, for instance, you know, the, 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 the elite of, of the countries that have perpetuated these existing, um, you know, inequalities and, and power asymmetry. So, so it's more challenging, you know, uh, I would say in, in these parts of the world where, for instance, democracy uh, is still very fragile, right? Unlike in the U.S., although we've also seen in the U.S. in the recent uh, years that uh, even if it's the beacon of democracy for the world, you know, we always say Philippines got its democracy model from the U.S., it's still perhaps... Uh, fragile as well, right? And and democracy is still a work in progress uh, around the world. Um, so so there are challenges, but you know what are we doing? You know, really just you know sparking these conversations. And I think COVID nineteen uh, really provided us with uh, a new impetus. You know, to to be bolder, to be uh, more open, uh, to be more critical. Uh, I think again, I spoke of you know the 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 gift of digital technology. Uh, and how it perhaps is helping democratize global health education. It is also helping us connect with other similar movements around the world, no? As I've said, and I don't want to romanticize Twitter, a lot of people 
who are being colonized and affected are not on Twitter, but Twitter is also exploding with all these kinds of conversations, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, how can we uh, not just have these conversations domestically, but also connect, for instance, the decolonizing movements and conversations uh, um, among countries? Uh, I think we're now seeing a bit of that. Um, and and you, you've heard of this term, South-South collaboration, right? So there's not just South-South collaboration anymore in terms of research and in terms of education. I think there's also South-South collaboration in terms of strategizing on how to dismantle the uh, long uh, entrenched, uh, you know, structural uh, barriers and, and uh, again, sources of power asymmetry. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, work in progress, uh, a lot of challenges. And that's why there's also a, a need for, you know, critical allyship, for instance, from brothers and sisters from the global north, right? Because we can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. Uh, and, and so I'm really thrilled when I see a lot of the activity online, you know, uh, the colonizing global health alliances, etc. I think we need to continue growing, gr grow them uh, across boundaries, across geographies, across generations, uh, because it cannot be just the young people talking about the colonizing. We need the senior leaders to be, um, you know, on board as well. Uh, and also, it's not just academia. We need to have alliances with the field of, of policy and practice. A few weeks ago, I was invited to speak in Geneva to the Global Fund and to Gavi, and they're all you know, interested in this subject. Uh, and they were asking me questions and I was very frank to them. You know, they wanted to colonize Global Fund and Gavi, move to Africa and, and don't sit comfortably there and start commissioning projects, not to Harvard and Hopkins and London School, but to emerging global health institutions in the global south, you know, if we really want to build long lasting capacity for global health research. I know it's going to be very difficult because one thing that I heard from my global north friends is that are we, uh, you know, in a way, uh, in, you know, in the pursuit of giving space to others, are we kicking ourselves out of the job, right? You know, uh, and, and that's something very critical. And, and that's unfortunate that we're seeing this as a competition. You know, either we get the contract or you get the contract. I think that's a conversation that we still need to, to, to have and, and an honest conversation that we still need to have. I'll stop there. Yeah, that's, that's great. And we have a, a related follow-up question from my colleague Erica um, Larson, who um, said, thank you for flagging the piece on USAID. So our, our group is actually a part of that consortium. So it's something we've been talking a lot about. Um, so funders are, you know, really in the driver's seat in a lot of ways in global health and shape a lot of the incentives driving continued colonization or colonial practices. So how would you suggest that recipients like UCSF help shift the donor mindset to start investing more directly in local institutions, given this competitive environment right. that we really just talked about? I think what should have happened is that at the proposal stage, there should have been global health or global South institutions already on board, right? It shouldn't be an afterthought. Oh, we forgot one African institution. Let's add them, you know, later on. Or, you know, we can just subcontract one aspect of it later on. For now, you know, the proponents are all Global North institutions. I think that has to change, you know. And that means at the, at the incubation stage, inception stage, it, it, when it's still a seed of an idea, you know, if we truly want to decolonize a, a global health consortium or a project, we should have you know, um, institutions from the global south to be on board, you know, and, and you know, better if it's a 50-50 split, right? You know, you have 50% from the US and Europe, and then 50%, you know, let's say if it's an African project or a, an Africa-focused project, then, you know, have uh, African institutions be on board. So, so that's one, you know, I think we should be uh, our own advocates, you know, we cannot convince USAID perhaps to change their policies overnight, but we can show to them that, hey, this, uh, you know, uh, global health project with diverse leadership is really the way forward, right? And, and because our goal is really to build long-lasting uh, capacity. 
Um, and, and I think that's a question for p uh, places like UCSF. Uh, are you ready to make those kinds of, uh, you know, bold proposals? Again, because, and, and, and you in connecting to your question a while ago, Naomi, about the business model, it might hurt your business to have more actors uh, having a slice of the pie, right? And, and so how, how, how will you, um, you know, address that? That's, I think, an internal question for you to, to answer. <laughs> Great. Well, we clearly needed more time, <laughs> and I hope we can have follow-up discussions because this was really um, fantastic. We have a series, so so yeah. this is just the start. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I want to hand it over to Eliza, who's going to um, close us out out for the day. Yes. Thanks, Naomi. And I want to say thank you, Lorenzo, as well, for taking the time out of your early Friday morning to be with us in this important and insightful conversation. Um, and as you just mentioned, while you are the first of our monthly speaker series um, to come share your experience and knowledge on the topic of decolonizing global health, um, Renzo will not be the last. So the IGHS Decolonizing Global Health Group is coordinating a monthly speaker series um, to bring different perspectives to IGHS. Our next session is on May 27th um, from 1 to 2 p.m. And we'll actually be joined by Desmond Jumbam, um, and Renzo, you shared one of his recent um, publications called How Not to Write About Public Health or About Global Health. Um, and yeah, we'll send out more details shortly about next month's event, um, but we're really excited to have um, Desmond be joining us next month and we hope everyone can join as well. Um, and so on behalf of our Decolonizing Global Health work group, I want to say thank you again to Renzo and thank you to Naomi for steering us through today's conversation. Um, we'll be sharing the recording shortly, and we hope to see you all again next month. Thank you again, and see you in the decolonized future. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Renzo. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye, everyone.